Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where we know the difference between right and wrong. In the United States, you have the right to free speech. You can say anything you like if you don't hurt anyone. Kinda. For much of the 19th and 20th centuries, this right did not exist if the government thought your speech was obscene, and they gave one man the power to enforce his will on the entire nation. Today we bring you the story of Anthony Comstock, a moral crusader who couldn't be stopped. Right and Wrong Anthony Comstock was born in New Canaan, Connecticut on March 7, 1844. His father was a farmer and his mother was a deeply religious woman. Anthony's mother passed away when he was just 10 years old, but he held on to her fanatical religious beliefs. Like his mother, he believed that the devil was everywhere. The only way to stop Satan was to clear his mind of all impure thoughts. It wouldn't take long for Anthony to start trying to clear the impure thoughts of other people, too. His brother died at the Battle of Gettysburg. Then, a few months later, in December 1863, Anthony enlisted in the Union Army, but he wouldn't participate in any significant Civil War battles. Instead, he was stationed in a relatively safe area of Florida. The soldiers in Florida entertained themselves with alcohol and gambling. Sometimes they purchased prostitutes as well. Anthony was enraged by this immoral behavior. He could do little to stop them from indulging in sinful vices, but he swore to find a way to fight against this bad behavior. By 1868, Anthony Comstock was no longer in the military. He lived alone in a boarding house in New York City, and he was astonished by the things he saw in the city. Prostitutes were common, pornographic materials were everywhere, and women even had access to abortions. Although Anthony could resist temptation, not everyone could. One of Anthony's friends began reading pornographic books. Then he visited a prostitute and caught a sexually transmitted disease. Anthony decided enough was enough. He went to the store his friend liked to visit and bought an obscene book there. Then he took it to the police, demanding they arrest the bookseller and confiscate the inventory. Thanks to an obscenity law passed in 1865, it was illegal to distribute these materials. The police did Anthony's bidding. His career as a vice hunter had begun, and his desire to enforce morality was growing. Suppression of Vice Anthony Comstock wasn't the only person who wanted to punish immoral behavior. In 1844, an association called the Young Men's Christian Association was created in London. It soon spread to the United States, too. The YMCA focused on providing young men with fitness and education services. Most importantly, it helped them maintain proper moral behavior. The YMCA was able to fulfill its mission because of very wealthy patrons. In 1872, the wealthy members of the organization became aware of Anthony's fight against bad behavior. So in 1873, they provided the funding required to create the New York Society for the Suppression of Vice. The society alone wasn't enough to fight obscenity in New York, so Anthony and his wealthy backers petitioned Congress to act. This resulted in the passage of the Comstock Act on March 2, 1873. The new law made it a crime to send any obscene materials in the mail anywhere in the United States. This included materials that discussed birth control or abortion. And under Anthony Comstock, even more topics would become forbidden. He was appointed as a special agent for the Postal Service. This gave him the authority to enforce the new obscenity laws anywhere in the nation, and Anthony would embrace these new powers with great enthusiasm. In 1876, Congress amended the Comstock Act, allowing Anthony to be even more zealous in enforcement. The amendment claimed that anything which served an immoral purpose was forbidden. This extended far beyond literature that discussed abortion and contraception. Postcards with unacceptable things written on them could be seized and the author arrested. Even anatomy textbooks for medical schools were forbidden. Students had to acquire classroom materials without using the mail. Otherwise, Anthony would make sure they were prosecuted. His desire to ruin lives was just getting started. Stopping Obscenity Authors in the United States had to be careful. If Anthony thought a writer produced immoral works, he would ensure that person went to prison. Anthony would order a copy of the book through the mail. After it was delivered, he would use it as evidence to prosecute the author and possibly the seller. It was a trick he used several times. 
In 1876, Ezra Haywood was living in Princeton, Massachusetts. He spent most of his time trying to spread anarchist ideas. One of the causes he supported was equality for women. He was also a member of the free love movement. This meant that he believed the government should not have a role in regulating sexual relationships between consenting adults. He released a pamphlet called Cupid's Yokes, which expressed his ideas of sexual equality. He also attacked Anthony Comstock and wanted the Comstock Act repealed. Anthony ordered a copy of the pamphlet through the mail, then arrested Ezra. In 1878, a jury found that Ezra violated federal obscenity laws and sentenced him to two years of hard labor. Ezra Haywood had a lot of supporters who appealed to President Rutherford Hayes requesting a pardon. Hayes didn't think it was a crime to write offensive pamphlets. Ezra was granted a pardon. But Ezra was not the only person in prison for Cupid's yokes. D.M. Bennett was the publisher of a periodical entitled Truth Seeker. He distributed Ezra Haywood's pamphlet and was arrested for it. Bennett was sentenced to 13 months in prison and did not receive a pardon. Anthony Comstock continued to monitor the mail for obscene material and he wasn't afraid to go after famous authors too. In 1882, Walt Whitman published Leaves of Grass. Although it sold well, it also violated the Comstock Act. Some poems described sexuality and that was illegal. The publisher asked Whitman to remove the offensive passages, but he refused. Anthony wasn't able to send Walt Whitman to jail, but he stopped the famous writer from reaching his audience. Anthony kept the obscene material that the post office confiscated. He would periodically have public burnings where he destroyed the offensive publications. He supposedly burned over 15 tons of books during his crusade. He also had a habit of prosecuting women, and some of them chose death because of it. Immoral Women Few things bothered Anthony Comstock more than when women openly discussed sex. He especially didn't like the idea that they might be able to use contraceptives to prevent pregnancy. When Anthony went after these women, he did everything he could to ruin them. Madame Restel was born in Painswick, England on May 6, 1812. She moved to New York City in 1831 when she was 19. At first, Madame Restel made a living by working as a seamstress, but soon she became a midwife. She advertised herself as a female physician. One of the services provided was abortions. However, only surgical abortions were illegal in the early 19th century. Medicines that caused it to happen were not against the law. In 1845, the state of New York outlawed abortion entirely. Madame Restel helped a woman with an abortion after this law was passed, resulting in a one-year prison sentence, but it didn't stop her from trying to help more women. Anthony Comstock would finally end Madame Restel's career and her life. In 1878, he pretended to be a customer looking for birth control pills. He was able to prove that Madame Restel was selling them. Anything related to sex was obscene and therefore illegal, so he arrested her. On April 1, 1878, she decided that dying was better than going to prison. Madame Restel climbed into the bathtub, then slit her own throat. Anthony didn't feel any remorse when his victims committed suicide. If anything, he became more determined to fulfill his mission. Ida Craddock was born in Philadelphia on August 1, 1857. She was very well educated, and in 1882 she applied to join the faculty of the University of Philadelphia. Ida was rejected because she was a woman. She never married, but claimed to have an ongoing sexual relationship with an angel. Thanks to this strange relationship, she became interested in giving advice on sexual relations. Ida wrote several instructional tracts, which she distributed in the mail. She first became a target for Anthony's crusade in 1899. Ida received a suspended sentence for her first offense, but it didn't stop her from writing about sex. In 1902, she was put on trial again, and this time she went to prison for three months. As soon as Ida was released, Anthony arrested her again. On October 10, 1902, she was found guilty of violating the Comstock Act and was sentenced to five years in prison. Ida was 45 years old and considered five years equivalent to a life sentence. So the day before she was supposed to report to federal prison, Ida slit her wrists and ended her own life. Anthony Comstock continued putting women in prison for decades, but some of them fought back. 
and their most powerful weapon against him was ridicule. The Comstock Syringe Sarah Chase was born in Claremont County, Ohio on January 18, 1837. She spent most of her childhood in Broome County, New York. Sarah found that she had a passion for writing and talking about religion, and she also wanted to help people, but her family was poor. And since Sarah was a woman, she had difficulty getting accepted to universities, but she would overcome her obstacles. At 16, Sarah began working as a teacher's assistant. She earned enough to attend Alfred University. After graduating, she found a medical school that would accept her. In 1868, Sarah realized how she could put her education to use. She visited churches and universities and lectured about sex, specifically birth control. And when she finished the lectures, she sold syringes to those who wanted them. In the 19th century, birth control was not widely available. Women during this era started trying to prevent pregnancy by using syringes. They would mix home remedies into a solution, then they would use a syringe to inject the medicine into the birth canal. In some cases, they also used this method to perform abortions. The Comstock Act made it illegal to offer indecent products. However, Sarah wasn't giving women any medication. She was simply giving them a syringe with valid uses beyond birth control. In May 1878, Anthony Comstock went to Sarah's house. He gave her a fake name and said he wanted to buy a syringe. Sarah sold it to him and he left. Anthony returned with the police later that day and arrested her. Sarah was charged with selling items that would be used for an unlawful purpose. A grand jury decided there wasn't enough evidence to charge Sarah. After being released, she sued Anthony Comstock. Sarah asked for $10,000 in damages, worth around $275,000 today. But she was never able to win a judgment against him. Sarah then decided she could do more to inconvenience her opponent. She published a progressive journal that advocated for women's rights. She used the platform to expand her campaign against Anthony Comstock. In June 1878, she advertised a new product that readers could purchase. Sarah was offering to sell a device called the Comstock Syringe. The advertisement said, We trust that the sudden popularity brought to this valuable syringe by the benevolent agency of the enterprising Mr. Comstock will prove to suffering womanhood the most beneficent act of his illustrious life. Anthony was so angry he tried to indict her again. His attempts failed, but Sarah's career would come to an end without his assistance. In 1893, a woman tried to get an abortion and the procedure nearly killed her. She went to Sarah Chase for help. Sarah tried to save the woman, but her efforts failed. The authorities rewarded Sarah by charging her with manslaughter. She was found guilty and remained in prison until 1899. The Final Opponent Anthony Comstock would spend his final years trying to imprison the woman who would ultimately defeat him. Margaret Sanger was born in 1879 in Corning, New York. By 1911, she was married and living in New York City. She was a very busy woman. Margaret joined the New York Socialist Party and participated in several labor movements. She also worked as a nurse. After seeing several botched abortions that killed women, she became disgusted. Margaret decided that birth control needed to be available even if the government thought the topic was too obscene to discuss. She began publishing a newsletter called The Woman Rebel, which promoted contraception. In August 1914, Anthony Comstock made sure that she was indicted for violating federal laws. Rather than stand trial, Margaret fled to England. She wrote the following about Anthony Comstock's crusade. When the Constitution of the United States authorized Congress to establish post offices and post roads, it was not intended that the authority should go beyond this. It did not authorize it to censor the matter to be conveyed, nor to sit in judgment upon the moral or intellectual qualities of the printed matter or parcel entrusted to it to deliver. The post office was primarily a mechanical institution, not an ethical one, whose business was efficiency not religion or morality. Margaret would continue to fight oppressive laws for decades, but her battle with Anthony Comstock would not last long. He developed pneumonia and died on September 21, 1915. With his passing, the government's desire to prosecute her also died. 
In 1921, Margaret founded the American Birth Control League, which would later become Planned Parenthood. The Comstock Act remained in effect until 1965, when the Supreme Court ruled that restricting the right of married women to access contraception violated marital privacy. Unmarried women didn't receive the same right until another ruling in 1972. Was Anthony Comstock an evil man? Was he misguided? Or do you think he was doing the right thing? Could this happen again today? Tell us what you think in the comments below. Usually, this is the part where I ask you to like the video and subscribe to our channel, but this time I'm going to tell you not to do that. You don't deserve to receive the wisdom that this channel vomits out into the world every week. Of course, if you think I'm wrong, there's nothing I can do to stop you from doing that thing I just refuse to ask you to do. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.